to Mind Escape. Are you ready? Are you ready to escape your mind? Alright folks, welcome back to Mike Maurice's Mind Escape. We have episode number 303 tonight. We are joined by special guest Dennis Walker. You might know him better as Micropreneur on uh, different social media outlets. Uh, He's on X, that's how I connected with him there. You're on all of them I assume, right? I'm on everything, Gmail, Yahoo, TikTok, you name it. Dude, didn't you hear on X they're taking Gmail away, bro? It's hard it's to keep trending. Up these days. Yeah. Now it was something like they're taking away HTML in the in the email system and people like flipped out thought they were taking away emails and stuff today. It was pretty funny watching X. But uh but yeah, here we are. 303. We're gonna be discussing psychedelics, the psychedelic community, um, all that great stuff. Please check out uh Dennis's stuff. I have the link down at the bottom next to that little cute mushroom and uh yeah, uh, he's got a podcast, uh, Micropreneur, which I highly recommend. I was listening to a few episodes, loved it. There's actually a lot of crossover guests too, believe it or not, uh, even though he's super focused on the psychedelic industry. Obviously, we've talked about it probably 30% of the time on here. Um, but yeah, uh, go check that out. And uh, yeah, if you want to support Mind Escape, the easiest way to do it is just to click our link tree link down below. Or go check out our documentary, As Within, So Without, from UFOs to DMT, which looks at both of those phenomenon through more of a psychological lens as opposed to a external physical uh, lens. Um, anyways, uh, but I'm really super pumped for this conversation. And uh, so if you don't know who Dennis is, he's a satirist or satirizer. What are you, a satirizer? Like, what, what, what are we calling you here? I would call it a satirist, but it's also not a super commonly used word. So I had to learn that by people telling me that I was a satirist. But yeah, satire. Yeah, satire. And uh, yeah, I think you should go with satirizer. You're just like zapping people, you know, like. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Well, I was just curious, like how you perceive yourself. Like, are you just like, oh, I'm a podcaster. Oh, I'm a, or, you know, you obviously wear different hats, but like, what's your you know that's i would say that's probably what it is based on looking at all your content yeah totally i've landed on the role of satirist or being the court jester if you will and we were chatting briefly earlier before the podcast started about in my opinion how serious everyone is all the time right now and how the antidote to a lot of my personal anxieties and worries is to take things a little bit less seriously, have a little bit more fun. And in a strange twist of fate, oftentimes that opens a lot of the doors that I was trying to open when I was, you know, super up uptight about everything. It was like just taking myself a little less seriously. We're a bunch of monkeys floating through space, trying to navigate the new Gmail regulations and X rebrandings and all that, you know. So if you get uptight about stuff all the time and take everything so seriously, that's not a lot of runway towards a, a brilliant future, in my opinion. No, absolutely. Perfectly said. Um, why don't you give us a little bit of your background? Like, how did you get into the psychedelic stuff? Is it something you've always been fascinated with? And then how did you get into this making this satire and kind of poking fun of the psychedelic community, specifically like corporate delics, stuff like that? It's a happy accident, Mike. I was... Doing Well, yes, I've been into psychedelics by way of my early fascination with cannabis, the gateway drug that it is, going back to sophomore year of high school, onward to mushrooms, which typically the same people who had cannabis had mushrooms. If you have one dealer, they usually have a few things. And I kind of slowly navigated that one because it wasn't something that I was raised around. So I, you know, through anecdotal evidence of friends sharing stories, over a couple of years, I decided to just go for it, had a really mind blowing, cathartic, beautiful, transformative experience. So I feel lucky in that regard that it wasn't just 
this kind of like thing I did as a drug. It was a, a really profound experience from the get go for me on a relatively small so dose. Were you like 15, 16, somewhere around there? First time I ate mushrooms, I was 17. First time I yeah. smoked cannabis, I think I was early 16, maybe late 15, right around Sim there. Similar for me, it was 13 cannabis and like 15 mushrooms. But, um, so was it something like, I've always just been curious. Like I wanted to play with my mind a little. I knew there was something more to this thing and I was raised Catholic. I'm like, this, this doesn't resonate with me at all. You know? So like, um, at what point, um, was it just like, oh, this seems cool, or was it something where it's like, oh, I, I, I think that there's probably more to perception or something along those lines? Yeah, after my first cannabis experience, first handful of experiences, I had psychedelic experiences with cannabis, which people will sometimes tell you about, where I remember smoking one bowl, going to bed, and having closed-eyed visuals of all kinds of colorful patterns, not too different from what you might see on a different entheogen or psychedelic. And that opened my mind in a million ways to thinking about what else is out there? What, why didn't I learn about this? Why did I learn in school that weed scrambles your brain and makes you stupid? Yet most of the people that I know who are interested in weed are creative, intelligent, artistic, musical people. And those two, that cognitive dissonance didn't line up. So then next thing is I'm on Arrowwood forums. So I have a great debt of gratitude to the Arrowwood forums, as many of us psychonauts do, because there wasn't a lot of reliable, comprehensive information around back in the day. You had your drug education, quote unquote, your D.A.R.E. program. You had friends telling you stories, but you know those varied in intensity and quality. And then at some point, I discovered Arrowhead and I just started going down all the forums, started reading as much as I could, and I became really fascinated by mushrooms. I got to travel quite a bit and I would hear these stories from people about like in their cultures that they would go foraging for mushrooms. And at some point, just hearing the stories, reading on Arrowhead, having really positive experiences with cannabis, I decided to go for it with a few friends, had a 1.7 gram dose. So definitely more than a microdose. I'd call it a museum dose. And I'm still very fond of that dose where I was in a carnival atmosphere at the Del Mar Fair in San Diego. I saw Ozo Motley play. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Incredible. I mean, the whole thing sounds delightful. I don't know about the band, it, but I, it I mean, great. It, yeah. it was a really cathartic, beautiful experience. Opened my mind to the possibility that there was a lot more to the picture here. And then I discovered Terrence McKenna. You know, there were only limited information sources in my world at that time. And uh, one thing leads to the next. And then I dove in head first. And the, the trip continues, my friend. Yeah, you mentioned musicians. I mean, that's how we got myself, Maurice, my co-host, when he's on here. Uh, and he's not on here most days now. But uh we are cousins and we grew up like into fish, Grateful Dead, Almond Brothers, that kind of stuff. So like that was part of that culture. You know, you go to a fish show and there's Shakedown Street and everybody's offering you basically everything you're describing. So like that was all part of that culture. We were fascinated too. We were reading like electric Kool-Aid acid tests when we were in high school and on the road and Dharma bums and all that kind of stuff too. So, um, but it's cool that like everybody's got like a different origin story on like how they got into all this stuff too. Um, but when you look at what's going on uh, now, um, do you feel like having that background or having been associated with these things for like a while that maybe it, it's it's a little bit easier to poke fun at what you're seeing now? Because like you said, everybody takes it so seriously. There's money at stake. There's just it's a whole different ball game than like scoring you know, a bag of mushrooms or, you know, when salvia was like available at pipe shops and things like that, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's a completely different thing now. So like, do you, do you think it's easier or do you think you have to get more creative when you're creating the satire? A little bit of both. I think, you know, it was a long wind up to get to the position I'm in today. And it went through a lot of different iterations over the years, playing in bands, being very interested in psychedelics. I went to school in San Francisco. That was where I got my undergrad. So I was living a stone's throw from Haight Street and from Golden Gate Park. And I spent five years there. And my freshman year, I had access to anything you could imagine and really high quality of it just by virtue of being connected to this sort of artistic and tech community there. 
my first semester, within the first six weeks or so, I had a half gram of really potent DMT. And that's an atypical college experience in 2007. I had two CB. I had, you know, basically anything you want, mescaline. So I just started. That, that really, was really super rare for you to have all that access, because even if you were part of like the hipster crew or whatever, the hippie crew, you know, it was still kind of hard to find some of those rare things. I think I was offered... Maurice and I were offered DMT once on our, we were taking a Greyhound bus, bus to see fish in Cincinnati, I think in like 03 when we were in high school. Um, and, and when we got there, the guy that was we were talking to behind us, he's like, oh yeah, we can get you DMT. It's like $100 a gram. I'm like, eh, we'll pass. Even though we were aware of what it was via the Irwid trip reports, that seemed out of this world, you know, like my regular reality was instantly replaced with an alien world and you're like holy crap you know like yeah mushrooms you know it'll take you somewhere but that's a whole different ball game but uh, yeah i think even dmt was super rare with it, it you know until you get joe rogan on the scene and else is the most popular drug psychedelic drug discussed right a thousand percent. When I got it, the people I got it from told me that they're like, this is very rare. We had been hanging out. They're like, we can get you a half gram of this if you want it. And I just thought, I want to try all of it. And you guys are cool. And I've had good experiences with the other stuff. So let me try it. And I didn't see it again for like 10 years. Like, you know, DMT, quote unquote, came across my path. But the difference between the full sense I got early on from that first batch I had versus what I was getting a few years later it, you know, didn't have the same potency. And now it seems like it's back to being in vogue because one of the things I like to talk about is that psychedelic chemistry and science has kind of been democratized because so many people are interested in it. There's a lot of brilliant people. There's a lot of people who understand lab science extraction. You know, you've got your chonga, which I've tried various forms of chonga to different capacities and potencies. And then you got your synthesized lab grade, GMP grade DMT, and it's quite an experience. So I've learned to kind of curb some of my appetite, if you will, rather than trying to just get, you know go crazy all the time, which I went through that phase a little bit. And I'm very lucky that I had a strong mental constitution and a good sort of set and setting. You know, San Francisco was a wild place. It's definitely turned into a little bit more of like a tech microdosing kind of like wealthy vibe from every time I go there recent, you know, recently, but back in like 2007, 2000, 2009, it was kind of the wild west. Right. And uh, so I'm fortunate in that regard that a lot of the people that I went to undergrad with were also, you know, doing crazy shit. And it was kind of normalized to a degree uh, in a very, you know, merry prankster sort of merry band of rogue way and yes i have seen the dead as well although i didn't actually i haven't caught a fish show yet and i'm well aware that i'm lacking there right on yeah um i mean so we weren't old enough to really i'm, I'm just trying to think so i saw the other ones which was everybody but jerry even with robert hunter like doing like a halftime singer songwriter walk around with his guitar type thing um and that was maybe oh two oh three so one one somewhere around there um but yeah i i mean jerry what was jerry's last show 95 in chicago um and i've seen the dead without jerry i've seen him with different variations of the guitar player my favorite was jimmy herring who's in widespread panic now but um but yeah man i mean i, I love all that stuff obviously and i think that those two things kind of go the the world of improv and that lifestyle kind of go along with it and I was really thinking hard about it the other day um and you know there's a lot of crossover between those two scenes the jam band scene and the the, the psychedelic scene um in fact Osley and all I mean a lot of those people were a large part of getting that stuff uh around back in the day what do you think in terms of because everything's changed and it used to be underground like that there used to be these, uh, you know, clandestine chemists and things like that. But now you're going to, I just saw your post, you're going to conferences where they're talking about this stuff and large events and things like that. Do you think that that's going to have a large impact on the culture of it? Meaning that whatever this origin story 
you know, in America, at least, obviously these things have been used forever across the world, but just in America specifically, do you think that that's going to alter the way we look at them and perceive them, you know, cause I, I think you've got your hand on the pulse right now. Yeah, I definitely think that's the case right now. And I think that social media is playing a big role in that. The fact that people are out here with brands being very public facing about being a mushroom cultivator, about, you know, being a microdosing coach, et cetera, et cetera. And especially at these conferences, you, you notice there's a lot of people who just kind of pivoted in. And I think that's great. Like, it's kind of it's awesome that more people than ever are interested in psychedelics. But I think with the social media sort of uh, self-promotional flair that is encouraged with it, and also this idea of psychedelics being an industry, an emerging market, it incentivizes a lot of people who have these profound experiences to pivot in and then start trying to make a brand, start trying to be a thought leader. And I'm kind of vocal about like, pump the brakes a little bit. Like you honestly, unless you have a decade, two decades plus experience with these substances, you don't know how it's gonna turn out for you three, four years from now. And I say this coming from a place of compassion of having periods of my life where I've you know completely recklessly indulged in various substances for days or weeks on end or whatever, and then really having to hit the pause button at a certain point and be like, bro, I need to figure my my stuff out before, you know, and especially the fact if someone doesn't know how these things are gonna play out over five years, 10 years plus, and they're like bringing others into the fold with them, you know, which is very tempting too. Um, so it's something I've written about a lot. You know, I write for a few different platforms, but about how social media amplifies this idea that, we need to move faster. We need to get ahead. You know, we need to to establish ourselves. And and I don't know if that's the message that I ever got from psychedelics. Like I certainly got messages that I should have an interesting life and I should take some calculated risks and enjoy myself. But like when I was macro dosing in my early days, never at any point was the message I got that I should start a brand and, you know, oh, I need a company and a logo and a website. It was actually quite the opposite. You know, I I was around the tech bubble and my psychedelic experiences throughout 2007 to 12 when I was at USF and after that kind of steered me away from wanting to be part of the man, you know, and, and uh, so it's kind of funny to see that script flipped on its head where now it's being sort of co-opted and a lot of the press you see says like psychedelics for business leaders, can, can psychedelic retreats improve the efficacy of a C-suite executive and they're, they're dude, microdose you know, LSD. You'll, you'll crush coding, bro. Straight up. Exactly. Easy for satire from my, from my lens. Absolutely. Which, um, ironically, I do have a brand now. So I, I again, I'm low hanging <laughs> fruit, you know, I'm like, I'm so easy. You to gotta make fun, make fun of yourself. And you, look, you 100%. do have to have like, people are like, Oh, I gotta dissolve my ego. You need your ego. It's just what you feed it. If you feed it good stuff and you're introspective and you know, I, I think that that's the other day I kind of had a thought where it's like, and then this might sound controversial, but, um, I do think that, you know, like people say, Oh, there's a lot of elitists and whatever. If you want to talk about elitists as in trying to be the best version of yourself, then I would agree with that. Cause I do think that you have to have like a level of introspection. If you're just going to give, if, if they're, cause they do talk about this and they've done studies on like people with like narcissism and people have no interest in doing psychedelics and then doing it and seeing if they can, you know, make them not a narcissist or not, you know, some sort of other psychological issues or whatever. Um, if you don't have that want of changing within you to become like a better person or whatever it is, you know, or, uh, um, uh, you know, a deeper thinker, uh, a better husband, a better father, whatever it is. Um, if you don't have that in you, I don't think it works the way that they're telling you, which is this model or whatever. I think that that's something that's in certain people that are ready to be there, if that makes sense. It totally does. And honestly, like it was never a goal of mine to have balanced mental health or healing with mushrooms or psychedelics. I wanted to explore. That's what was fascinating to me. I love traveling. You know, I, I was telling someone the other day, like, I want to go to Turkmenistan and go hang out there. They're like, why? It's like, because it's an intense, interesting place. And I like those kinds of things. And that's what drew me towards psychedelics, like reading about 
Terrence McKenna. And I do think he was a bit of a uh, optimist, hopeless, romantic, and saw the world with rose colored glasses. So I like to parody him as well, because he kind of has this like elevated, holier than thou status among psychonauts. But like, beyond a lot of these interesting predictions he had, just the fact that he was the first person that ever cogently, sincerely was able to describe these visual realms and to describe these macrodose mushroom experiences, reading Food of the Gods was a game changer for me. I had already had a, a 1.7 gram dose, a 3.5 gram dose where I started you know, to get patterns and it wasn't super deep. And then after reading about Food of the Gods and getting the sense of, I'm, I'm going to be okay if I do this. This isn't going to cost me my sanity. You know, like I'm going to be able to do this. And even if it gets really intense, I'll still have some semblance of me and, a, you know, an intact mentality on the other side. And again, different for everyone, you know, but uh, that sense of confidence and just reading about it be, and be the same, talking to friends, being like, wow, there's some pretty intelligent, interesting people who are doing macrodoses and living to tell the tale and also speaking in reverent tones about how Im impressive it was. And then I did a full send on seven grams in the darkness. And I got that level of catharsis, that le you know level of uh, having the roof blown off my imagination and being able to come back and still be pretty on point. You know, uh, certainly it changed me in a lot of ways as it would because it opened up my mind to all kinds of possibilities. But the bottom line was that I felt really dialed in afterwards. And I think when done responsibly with respect and when you're forming a personal relationship with the, the mushroom or cannabis or whatever it is, and not allowing sort of social programming and peer pressure to tell you to do it a certain way, kind of cutting that out and just saying like, okay, it's me and you. I want to do a full send. I'm, I'm in my safe place. I did my homework. I'm completely sober right now, like it delivered on the money in a big way. So uh, that's one of the things that, again, like I think social media and it's sort of the guru factor can complicate that relationship because you have a lot of people saying, do it this way, do it that way. And I suppose it's good to, you know, take people's advice with a grain of salt, you know, and uh, but I, I hope that in future generations, which I imagine this will happen and currently people can still have that sense of confidence to go directly between them and whatever that quote plant ally is, be it a mushroom or peyote or something synthetic, you know, just building that direct experience. And I think that's hugely valuable in this era of groupthink, of, uh, you know, being part of the herd. I think it's really valuable to have that personal experience where you kind of get your lid flipped and you have to figure it out on your own and put the pieces back together. Um, but that's my my perspective. I'm sure other people have very different perspectives. No, I mean, right on, man. I, I, that that all sounds great. I mean, again, I think it's one of those things where I'm all for it. You want to do it recreationally. You want to do it whatever. I mean, the way I look at it, like if you're going to talk about like therapies and things like that, as somebody, look, I have severe OCD that was resistant to all the different name, you know, an SSRI probably taken it at some point in my life um and ocd is pretty devastating when it gets really really bad um to the point where it's like you just want to lock yourself away for you know ever um and psilocybin was the one thing where it's like it was like going home and like resetting myself being able to look at myself outside of myself again even though i had previously taken it when i was younger um and had a really good relationship with it it's my favorite compound i just felt like you know, you get older, I was doing other things. I was going out to bars and drinking and partying, doing a little, you know, nose candy here and there and just, you know, partaking in the things young, dumb people do. Um, you know, when I moved to Chicago, when I was in my early twenties and, um, I had a great time, but you know, you have to pivot and, you know, my OCD got so bad where it's like, I have to figure something out. So I kind of just went back to what I knew, which was, you know, mind, expanding um as opposed to i feel like the other stuff kind of gives you like tunnel vision anyway alcohol and uh stimulants and things like that but um not to go off on a tangent but uh <laughs> um i i just think that when you're talking about therapies and you, you know that's where we get into this thing where it's like now there's maps and all these big companies and corporations and there's people trying to create research chemicals and they're trying to create 
you know, like tabernathalog, which is a psychoactive, non-psychoactive compound that's a component of uh, the iboga um, plant, you know. So they're even trying to make psychedelics that don't have any psychedelic effects to, to recreate that thing for maybe people that don't want it or whatever. But um, I think you have to just do what's right for you. Um, and I, th I look at it as like another tool for the toolbox. I never push it. I never tell people they should do it. Um, it's something that should be there if you want to try it. Um, and if you don't, cool, you know, I, you know, you got to do whatever works for you. Um, but yeah, as somebody that has had mental stuff going on here, I can tell you that just having that another option is, is super beneficial and people fight about the different aspects of the therapy thing. But, um, I think it'll just be a kind of uh, growing pains scenario, right? You're going to, they're going to push it through. But my question to you is, do you think this is going to go the way of cannabis or since it is a little bit different uh compound wise in terms of you know like cannabis you could still kind of function on some of these psychedelics you know depending on what it is it's it's a little bit different of a story so um what's your take on based on going to these events and talking with people how do you think that this is going to work out legally at some point there's certainly a lot of trends that are following in the footsteps of cannabis and a lot of the same parties are involved, you know, people who have grow operations, have invested in equipment, like when the farm bill passed, lots of people started investing in various extraction equipment and, you know, um, expanding what they were doing. And then uh, the next thing you know, mushrooms are in demand. And it's, it's the fact, ironically, that the FDA designated psilocybin and MDMA, but primarily psilocybin, as a breakthrough therapy in 2018, 2017 for MDMA, I believe 2018 for psilocybin. And then that kicked off this huge wave of investment, companies going public, Oprah talking about it, BBC, Sports Illustrated, we've all seen the coverage. Where are you gonna get the stuff? You've got people here saying, you know, from the biggest platforms in the world and trusted thought leaders and brands talking about how impressive the studies are and Johns Hopkins research and psilocybin for depression, and it's not available anywhere, quote, legally, right? So the thing about mushrooms is they're extremely easy to grow. They're in your neighborhood right now. And I think that ironically, that was an unintended consequence of trying to promote this sort of FDA legal bottleneck you know, it's supposed to be expedited when it's designated as breakthrough therapy. Sorry, but seven or eight years is not very expeditious, right? And in that time, now you've got moms in Colorado who had never even considered tapping into psilocybin mushrooms. They're the ringleaders now, and they're building transparent communities saying, look, I do this and it's awesome. And, you know, everyone and their mom literally has access to these. And if people don't know where to get them, it's very hard, you know? There's a, a, a ton, there's an abundance of it. The market is flooded right now. So all this to say that I don't think that this was intended when, you know, the FDA and the powers that be wanted to rigidly regulate these substances. And ironically, now in a state like Colorado, when they're drafting the legislation there, like mushrooms aren't as receiving as much attention as like ibogaine or pe peyote. Well, those are very hard to find typically, right? So I feel yeah, like- Yeah, peyote definitely... only grows in one specific part of the South, right on the border of Texas and Mexico. But um, I mean, people cultivate them and stuff. But yeah, I mean, a cacti is not, even though it's a succulent, it's not an easy slam dunk, right? Same thing. So um, I don't know, man. I, I think you're you're right though about the the mushrooms. It's just so easy. Like I've never tried myself, but I know a lot of people that have cultivated them. And um, a couple people said it was harder than cannabis. Other people said it wasn't. So I, I you know, take it. Well, like for example, there's turnkey grow kits. They're ubiquitously available where you don't even have to do anything, and it's technically legal, uh, as far as I understand, and all the vendors and. One of the reasons I'm so public facing about this stuff is I'm not involved in vending or anything. I'm merely commentating. You know, I realized this a number of years ago that there was going to be a need for educational platforms and that at least currently information is not illegal. You know, and we have other great psychedelic media platforms who have figured this out to varying degrees. And that's another thing is you have all of these people like myself and various other platforms who are giving pretty solid information about 
mushrooms, about different psychedelics, and people can make an informed decision for themselves. I think that's what it comes down to is I, I disagree with this sense of strong gatekeeping and patenting. And while I do recognize that there's probably merit to some of that stuff, and I might even disagree with some of my close friends about that. I had a conversation yesterday about this, about can't we all just get along? Isn't there room for everyone under the big tent? That's kind of how I like to see it. But, you know, other people don't see it the same. They see the roots and the suits, the underground, which is really, really uh, robust at the moment. And then this more corporate legal biotech sector, which likes to take their sweet time doing anything. And I do think that there's a future track for that. I just don't think any of the people who thought they were, you know, getting involved to this, this shroom boom, legal psychedelics, I, they don't know what they're talking about. It's so obvious. And that's, again, goes back to what we we're saying about like, if you have a track record, if you've been around these things, you know, you kind of see the hype bubble for what it is. And, and people are gonna at some point, hopefully figure that out. And again, if this stuff actually works the way all of these larger companies are trying to tout it, you know, saying 10 years of therapy in one night in some cases, which is an egregious overrepresentation, but one that I've seen made nonetheless, like, we saw it with ketamine, you know, ketamine is the, the thing. And, you know, next thing you know, there's 800 plus ketamine clinics in the US. And now, you know, they're all like $100 million companies are going broke. Uh, there's a number of them, right? And the same thing has happened, I think, with the more corporate sector. It doesn't mean there's not a future for psychedelics in a medicalized capacity and state regulated frameworks. I'm pretty confident we're going to see that be it next year or the year after. And I'm not really trying to like derail that momentum. I think that criticizing it and scrutinizing it is fair. Any powerful institution or movement should be scrutinized and criticized. But my goal is not to be out here muckraking against psychedelic companies or whatever. I just want to have fun, keep doing what I'm doing, offer some analysis based on a lot of personal experience and being connected to a lot of different communities. And, you know, I, I have friends who kind of lost their mind on mushrooms and now they're doing just fine you know it's like they did their thing they were wild and now you know they, you hit a little psychosis you come back out of it you know it's part of the thing that i know there's some people doing great work raising awareness about this but there's this sense for the longest time of just like only emphasizing the positive aspect aspects and attributes which i'm unabashedly a proponent of psychedelics you know in the right circumstances for the right people but this blanket narrative that like everyone's going to be taking psychedelics. I call bullshit on that 100%. I think that, uh, for example, like in even some indigenous cultures I visited, like the Mazatec, who are the culture that Maria Sabina belonged to, right? And we got a lot of the information we have about psilocybin yeah, mushrooms. Like Gordon Wasson uh, life um, cover. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well, like having visited those communities on multiple occasions, having friends there, I want to say that I was told only about 30% of the people in the community even eat the mushrooms. So there's this like misnomer or this, this uh, misrepresentation that like all of the indigenous people used to do this or this is what our ancestors yeah, no, did. Yeah, uh, no, like, Hamilton Morris not. in that episode where he goes down there too and he does, I'm, I'm sure you've seen Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, but uh, yeah. he goes down there. Um, he's, he's trying to find Maria Sabina's house, which is supposedly like a not a UNESCO site, but something probably similar to the people in that area. Right. Uh, and he couldn't even, he had a tough time finding it. People were pointing him all sorts of different directions. And then to find mushrooms to do, um, even a cere uh, ceremony, I think with Maria Sabina's son, I think is that Apollonia or something like that. Um, he, they had to go find some other guy who had, uh, um, K Ressens growing out of, um, like sugar, cane or something or you know like uh, sugar pulp or something like that so um yeah it's not it, first of all i don't think it's in, in the wild these if you're not cultivating them these mushrooms are not that easy to find right you have to go on these hikes and i'm sure if you've seen alan rockefeller you know find all these you probably oh look he's always finding all these crazy mushrooms but i think it's a lot harder and you have to kind of know what you're doing right um but uh yeah, to, to your point, because that's something we've talked a lot about on the show, ancient psychedelic use. Well, I'm fascinated by it. It's one of my favorite topics. It's It wasn't as rampant across the ancient world as one might think um, in, in, in that regard, kind of what you're you're saying with the, the Mazatec people. Like you said, what you said, a third of the people might have used it. 
That's what I was told. And I've stayed with Maria Sabina's family and done ceremonies twice, 10 years apart at her homestead there. And also was kicking it with Alan Rockefeller this last weekend. And he's such a cool person. And these are people that I look up to, right? And a lot of them are so low key and unassuming and so unmotivated by purely financial profit or by the corporate elements of things and end up having amazing careers and lifestyles too. And I, I just appreciate that there are still people who, who, who do mushroom science and build mushroom community for the sake of the community and science, not for the end result of trying to secure a patent or, you know, cash out or try to fit this beautiful opportunity we have with mind expanding substances into this very rigidly state controlled pharmaceutical model. Yeah, you can try to force it in there for sure. But like, again, the unintended consequence is that more people than ever before, arguably in the history of the known world are doing mushrooms right now. And that's largely a result of this wave of publicity that was generated by a lot of the research institutions and powers that be. I guarantee you it was not their intention to set off a wave of millions and millions of people around the world more every day, learning how to cultivate mushrooms, learning about wild philosophies. That was 100% not the intent and that's a hundred percent what's happening right now absolutely um yeah i mean i don't even think when we started this podcast it was all going to be like i was going through like a spiritual awakening i had no interest in any of this kind of stuff i mean yeah i'd use psychedelics and use them for mind expansion things like that but I, i wasn't interested in metaphysics and the nature of reality and um anything like that Um, so we were on path to do like more of a, you know, a Joe Rogan style podcast with mostly just about like ancient civilizations and get weird about stuff. And, uh, (laughs) through that, I've, I've, I've got into philosophy. I started reading Plato's dialogues. I started looking into all the pre-Socratics. I got heavy into like actually doing the research on all these things. And when I do an episode, I dive in and we do a pretty diverse, you know, scope of what's out there in these topics but this to my point the psychedelic thing wasn't something that we talked when, when we were doing the podcast or like setting it up it wasn't like we didn't even have anything on the docket to talk about it and then i remember being on youtube and watching somebody talk about like there's only like a few videos at the time this was probably six seven years ago um and somebody was talking about like mental health and psychedelics i'm like oh well i do know about that maybe we should do an episode on that and we did like a couple episodes and all of a sudden people were like you know we love this and so i decided to open up a little bit more about all my trip reports and personal experiences and stuff like that so obviously there is a market or a niche for this and for what you're doing as well um I think that what you're doing is great too, because I don't see anybody else doing that. I, like I said, you know, we, we mentioned a couple of times people are very protective over this topic because I think because of the legal status for so long and everything, I think that that's why people get squirrely around it. But at the end of the day, um, we got to keep that culture of being able to make fun of ourselves, right? And keeping the humility and, and not letting it get too crazy, right? I mean, that's how I look at it at least. Yeah, dude, I I never planned on doing satire like I'm doing. I did my podcast for a full year and I was interviewing C-level executives, various CEOs and CFOs of publicly traded companies, journalists. My first interview was with my neighbor at the time and she was writing for Playboy about psychedelics. And then I had a friend who is a therapist and he's going through the official credentialing program to pursue psychedelic therapy in 2020, 2021 at one of these institutions. And my whole goal was to like solidify conversations about psychedelics with kind of people who are willing to talk about them, but who are also kind of contributing or part of the social fabric of society. I thought there was power there. And part of that was because I come from a very traditional background. So the idea of like me speaking publicly about psychedelics I felt like I had a chip on my shoulder with my family and closer circle of friends I grew up with where I had been dismissed already because they knew I was interested in psychedelics and no one took me seriously. And that totally put a chip on my shoulder once people started to do research and all this stuff came out where I'm like, look, I wasn't a super crazy wook. Definitely have some degree of crazy wookness in me, but like 
we're not all, you know, burnouts who are just going to take from society and give nothing back. So I did that for like a year and it was well-timed in that there weren't a ton of mushroom centric podcasts. There were really only a handful when I started. And I remember looking at the landscape, just like Googling, okay, who's doing a mushroom podcast. And I found like three or four and like two of them were good. I think two of them no longer exist. And when did you start? So thought, when, what year? In 2020. I started in 2020. Yeah. The, I mean, there, there's still not, like I can't think of that many. I mean, yours is super heavy, um, but there's like a couple psychedelic ones that I, you know, listen to. But well, I just I, I wanted to do a good job. It was a pandemic project. I came to this conclusion that the world was headed in such an unpredictable, volatile direction. You know, I was living in Malibu during the pandemic, and there were also the riots going on in Santa Monica. And I remember going up to actually participate in the protests. And then like, I got there a little bit late, maybe it was the following day. And there were just like firebombed buildings everywhere. The national guard was in the street. I'm sure people remember seeing this. And it was just so jarring to see this, to be like, whoa, we're in this global pandemic where I'm getting calls from the LA sheriff's department that I can't leave the house after eight. I'm on a curfew at this house. And there's National Guard in the middle of one of the most iconic tourist destinations, you know, right across from the beach. And I, I just thought, you know, I, if I share my personal experiences about mushrooms now, especially in light of the fact that so much research was coming out and other bigger platforms were doing it, then it's either now or never, you know, like 2015, 2010. I was just sharing these things in little echo chambers. I couldn't imagine speaking publicly about psychedelic use. I taught high school for a couple of years. I was a church youth group leader for a year. And the whole time I was like a fully closeted psychonaut. So once kind of the, everything hit the fan and it just started to get so volatile. Well, class, no, I me, met God last like night. <laughs> hey, class, yeah, I met God much, last night. <laughs> But then, yeah, a, a year in, I, I decided to make a satire video. Uh, I didn't know it was satire at the time. And I honestly have no idea what moved me to do it other than I, I learned about Instagram reels. I heard that if you make an Instagram reel, that it will boost your post and more people will see it. And I thought, I'll try this for the podcast. And I think I made a couple more serious reels and one of them got some decent traction. And then I made this kind of uh, woke capitalist psychedelic retreat center video that went super viral, at least for me at the time with like hundreds of thousands of views. And I thought, whoa, this is awesome. Like I, I made that in like an hour, two hours. It was super fun. And it just boosted the audience for the podcast. And then to the point where like people kept telling me like, do more of this, like people I went to college with, or I hadn't seen them in years, they would message me and be like, yo, my friend sent me this video and it's you, what are you doing? And like, you know, just after getting that kind of feedback and everybody just thinking it was hilarious, I thought, well, I'm going to double down on that. You know, like if you're a creator, a journalist, whatever, you make something that's coming from a place of authenticity and your audience appreciates it and shares it with their your friend. The next logical step is like, let me just do more of that. And then at a certain point, I just decided I'm just going to do one a day. I'm going to make one satire skit a day. And I'm going to treat it like improv where I'm not going to spend my whole day doing this. And mind you, I have a degree in media and I've been working professionally for different companies and projects. And I had my own company going back to 2016. So like, as I say, Liam Neeson style, like I have a very specific set of skills. Right. And uh, it just so happens that they lend very nicely to making a fool of myself on camera having fun and hopefully injecting a little bit of wit and a little bit of almost like a morality tale into it. And, uh, and then it just kind of took off and I, I still try to do it as often as I can. Yeah, dude, you're, you're great at it. Um, you definitely have the right disposition for it. Like you've always kind of got like a smile to or a smirk, like while you're doing it. Um, has anybody flipped out on you or sent you like a cease and desist or something like that? No, I mean, I've gotten, you know, my fair share of criticism as anybody who's quote public figure should. But I think, again, it's nice to have the podcast because people will watch the satire and like not everybody gets it. And then I'll be like, well, if you want to hear more in-depth analysis and conversations like we're having now, like I got the podcast. And, and at the end of the day, I've been building roots level community for so long that, you know, I'm so uninterested and like the quick sell. And I think with a lot of these new AI tools and technology, what it's doing is trying to get people to like build this big audience super fast. 
but it's like half of those accounts are probably bots. How well do you know these people? I'd way rather just like serve my friends, you know, and, and, and create content from that place where if you're doing it authentically, everyone will tell you this who's doing it, but like it tends to attract the right kind of audience, you know? So there have been people who like get super gung ho on what I'm doing and then they'll be there for a week in the audience, like super fan number one. And then they get offended by something and they dip. And I'm like, dude, honestly, now that, I could care dude, less. We could, do a I whole could care less. we could do a whole episode on what you just said because we have such a range of topics on this show because like we'll talk about UFOs one show. We'll talk about psychedelics one. We'll talk about how the pyramids were possibly built and like go over like real theories. And then we'll do one on like ancient Greek texts, you know? So it's like we're all over the place. So that was been, that's been the biggest hurdle while – the title of our podcast and the vibe of it, it's open platform and it's all about the mysteries of life via looking at it through the lens of philosophy and science. We cover a wide range. And so to your point, I think that that's the hard part. You know, it's scary to me that you have kind of like a more focused podcast and you're still saying that because I felt like that was one of the major drawbacks of our podcast is that somebody will listen to one because they're really into UFOs and then they'll listen to the next one about psychedelics and be like anti-psychedelic or whatever, you know, something along those lines. Yeah, you can't keep all the people happy all the time. I learned that as a high school teacher and it will serve you very well in life. And I think doubling down on your authenticity and building the roots level connections, like that that's the thing I think a lot of the more corporate psychedelic companies don't understand. It's like, I often be, I ask people like, how long have you guys known each other? Oh, you know, a year and a half. It's like me and my boy have been tripping for, you know, 2007, 2005, we've been kicking it and we picked up a lot of other wooks along the way. And all of us are still here. You know, I think there's real value to that to like uh, the event I went to in San Diego. Like they didn't even ask me to put my name on the flyer. They're just like, yo, we love you. You're from San Diego. We got, you know, all these mutual friends here. <laughs> You're coming. And that's awesome. I showed up and like, Every time you go to one of these events, it's old friends. You know, you're like, oh, dude, I haven't seen you in five years. Oh, man, remember when we were down in Guatemala and we did that thing? And I love being a part of that community, like that community that that uplifts and supports each other. I think that's another thing where trying to fit psychedelics into this corporate model. It's it's this strange level of competition and one upmanship. But like a lot of the really prosperous people, or at least what I consider to be prosperous, fulfilled, well-rounded people, they're all investing in each other. You know, it's like uh, I, I don't need to compete with the Mind Escape podcast. Like I'm just pumped. You're doing a podcast. I'm doing a podcast. Like same thing with a lot of the cool mushroom people I know. It's like they will literally give you proprietary secrets away, crowdsourced for free, and the, all these. You know, more gatekeeping companies are trying to patent and secure, you know, monopolies and market exclusivity. And it's like, how are they going to compete with people who are doing something actually arguably better than them? Like, honestly, better because they've been doing it for longer. And there's, there's your passion. Well, it, I think it's passion. I think that's if you love a topic or you love something and you're passionate about it. It will come through, especially if you're artistic and creative as well. It's not like somebody like you. Um I, you know, for me, I, I've been bitten by the bug, the not necessarily jealousy. It's not like, oh, I want that podcast or I wish I, you know, but it's like you watch other people around you grow faster or they did this or they made this or they attached themselves to this person or that or and it blew them up or whatever. And it's just like um, sometimes I think, do you have to do that? Because I, I want to just do what I'm doing, you know, like and just grow organically. But it's like to get, you know we've been doing this for six years, you know, it's not easy to do, um, a live show and, and keep it consistent and keep the, keep it relevant and do the research, read the books, do the stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've gotten frustrated, but like I had a near death experience in, uh, the weekend of Thanksgiving or the week of Thanksgiving and it kind of right after I got very mad for some reason, I'm not like that, like an angry person, um, and I started to kind of realize some things about myself, did a couple high dose edible um, nights, meditations. And, uh, you know, I was ready this year to start off this year shitting on a shitting on Graham Hancock and Joe Rogan and just picking apart all the stuff. And, I, and just like, you know, because these are people that I initially when I started, I'm like, oh, this is cool. And then I like actually did research. I'm like, oh, this is not cool. Um you know, I still listen to Rogan when if it's, you know, 
a scientist or somebody interesting. And I have no problem with him either. I do think that I wish he would read more books than just Sacred uh, Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. But um, <laughs> or read. It's asking a lot of Joe Rogan. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a busy man. He's a busy man, according to him. But. Um, but for me, it's like I decided kind of what you're saying. I'm just going to do focus on me and what I'm interested in. And, uh, you know, I have a life. I have a job. I, you know, whatever. I don't need this. This is just my passion project. And it always has been. And I've grown and learned and become a better person through doing this podcast. You know, become a better husband, better father, uh, a better person. And just more introspective and more well-rounded and educated. So... I don't feel that way anymore, but I, I do understand when people fall victim to that mindset. They're just not strong enough or maybe not in the right place to get out of it, if that makes sense. Well, there's a Korean proverb that says someone else's grain of rice always looks bigger. And I, I always try to take that into mind because all of us fall victim to that occasionally where we see someone else we want to compare ourselves to them and they did it exactly as you just said they did it this way and like oh, i've been grinding and like i certainly slip you know i think are you competitive who's... i'm a the problem is i'm a really competitive <laughs> i grew up playing sports i love like video games that are super competitive you know like i'm a competitive person so i think that that's part of what it is i'm definitely competitive for sure I'm definitely not beyond contradicting myself occasionally, but again, I try to be super transparent as often as possible. And that's where the community comes in. And like, I remember having this rough patch with Mycopreneur, like maybe two years ago at this point where it was kind of right before a lot of stuff started popping off or it was right around that time. And I was just like, what am I even doing? And I think I've seen younger content creators bring this up. I think it happens to everyone where you're like, I don't want this to be a chore. Like, I don't want to just go through the motions. Like you're at 303 podcasts. That's super impressive. So I applaud you for that. That's a, that's rarefied air, as you well know, because so many people will get going on something and then, you know, the honeymoon phase is over. And I kind of think that's what's happening with the psychedelic sector, quote unquote, right now, especially from a, a more monetary sort of financial standpoint, the honeymoon's over, you know, the hype bubble was like, I've grinded my ass Everyone's off, bro. I appreciate that because I've grinded my ass off pretty much. And that, that's what it takes, honestly. And at the end of the day, where I've come to personally is recognizing that the end result is not important. What's important is like being dedicated to your craft and like that is the reward i heard jerry seinfeld tell this story that he was ultra successful right jerry seinfeld everybody knows him and then he was in new york backstage and there was a comment going on and the, the comment comes up to him before his show and goes dude i just want to ask you like how, how did you do this because i've been grinding away forever and you know i haven't gotten my contract i haven't gotten my show and jerry goes you missed the point, the contract, the reward, the wealth. That's not the point. The point is that you get to do comedy. You get to go out on the stage tonight and do it. And that's such an empowering perspective, I think, to be like, bro, like I can't control if I'm going to be more successful than this person, but I can control if I show up and put out a really good podcast that I work my ass off, that I grind, even when it's inconvenient and, and that I get better. And I think that, yeah, so maybe it's a little bit, uh, uh, wonky of a statement, but I think there's a lot of beauty in that. Like, if you love what you're doing, like you don't necessarily care if you're, you know, more popular than the other person. Although it is nice. Oh, absolutely. To, I do have for sure. uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think that um, I think you're right, and I do think though, like when I say grinding, it's not that like, oh, I had to force myself to do it, but it's just like you have to constantly be like, what am I? For our format, at least, I have to constantly like pick up new topics like, oh, um, you know, read this book on consciousness or like just different theories and the whatever the newest book or theory or hypothesis on this topic, whether it be about space and time or psychedelics or whatever, um, just constantly reading. And, and when I'm not having guests on, because we do do solo shows too or just with me and a co-host um you know those ones are more educational so then it's like now i have to be more engaged and create somewhat of a um a thing here you know whether it be research or a slideshow or whatever um so i want to do that but it's hard it's hard to to keep doing something that long is just what it comes down to i guess and, and you're right it's it's even if you love it you know i'm sure 
there's times where Michael Jordan's like, I don't want to play basketball, or Wayne Gretzky's like, I don't want to play hockey tonight, but they did it, and they probably still scored goals, and they probably not, you know, I, I would love to get to that level of podcasting, but that's not even what I'm trying to do. I want to get to that level of a of thinking. I want to be the Michael Jordan of thinking, if that makes sense. You know, like, that's my goal, but um, yeah, I don't know. Dude, let's get weird, though. Wanna, let's get weird, and I have a question for you. I'm going to flip the tables here, but first, while it's on my mind, I want to shout out how badass your intro is. Like, I'm looking at your intro, and I'm like, I got to step my game up. You know, the whole visual elements, and I was really impressed with that. I've done a ton of podcasts. That was hands down the coolest intro I've seen, so I uh, just wanted to say that while, well, while I'm thinking Well, I really it. appreciate that, bro. That actually took a little bit of time because I wrote I made the whole song myself, all the musical parts. My wife, ask you. my wife was I the only other know. voice on on there, but I did all the guitar, the you know everything via MIDI controller and um, that stuff. And then for the visuals, I also put those videos together. I had my Maurice, who's my co-host, he's a professional videographer, help me with a couple transition parts. But yeah, man, I really appreciate it because that does take time, and nobody's really said that so. You know, well, that's the kind of stuff that game like recognized takes game, you know. On. Yeah, game recognized game, baby. <laughs> well, I want to ask you. I, I don't know if you've gone into detail about it yet or anything, but I'd love to hear if you want to share anything about the near death experience that you had because that's a super intense uh, situation, obviously. Yeah, I did. I'm doing a two part on it. I did part one, which was like the logistics of what happened, and it's kind of gross. So I'm not going to go into details, but let's just say a bunch of blood left my body in the worst way possible um just pouring out the downstairs and uh enough to lose consciousness in the shower um and i still don't have any answers it's you know i'm going to the follow-up for a gi doctor but since then i've lost a bunch of weight i've bought an exercise bike i work out every single day uh changed my diet completely um just kind of my relationship with like a lot of things. And then I also started taking like mushroom supplements and stuff like that. But from a perspective standpoint, like I just said, I was on pace to become like an angry grouch this year. Um, and it kind of, you know, it kind of put me on a different path. Um, and it is, terrible of an experience as it was and it kind of gave my wife PTSD from her having to come down and see me and call 911 and I was like in and out of consciousness and um that whole thing um you know I think that it's again made me stronger and a better person I'm healthier than I was before it happened now I, I assume hopefully everything's fine and I don't need any further intervention um based on all the tests that they've done it could have just been like a fluke thing because i was taking antibiotics for a venomous spider bite and that might have messed up my stomach in a certain way um but we'll see but um in terms of like i said i just it's made me a better person and on top of that like my mom who was here during it like she came to after my wife called her when the ambulance was arriving and stuff and I was losing consciousness sitting on the toilet and it was just like white light. Um, and I remember like, as I could hear them say, Oh, he's his, you know, his pulse is fading. And my mom said something like, Oh, Asher needs his dad. Asher's my two year old son. And, um, I, that hit me so hard and I like pop back up. I'm like, let's, let's do this kind of a thing. I slipped on clothes so they could get me into this like weird chair to get me up the stairs. And it's like four grown men carrying like a 380 pound dude up, you know, a flight of stairs from a basement, you know, it was just, uh, so again, I've, I've got to get, you know, I'm a big dude. I'm six, two. Uh, I got to get myself back into shape. I played football and lacrosse and, you know, hockey and stuff when I was younger in high school. So, um, baseball too, but I got kicked off the baseball team for smoking, um, pot and, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I just got to get back to that zone and, uh, I appreciate you asking. It's just, it's, I'm going to do a part two on the psychological, um, and the mystical components of it. Cause there was, I didn't see like God or anything like that, but kind of what I just described, there was like this moment of grace where, you know, I could see it going one way or the other and just fighting to be like alive, to be here for my son as long as possible. It's kind of the takeaway from it. 
Wow, man. Powerful testimony. So I'll look forward to tuning into both of those to check them out because I haven't had a near-death experience. I, I have, but it was more fighting for my life in a riptide at night in a very dangerous beach. I didn't know it was a dangerous beach. So there wasn't like the whole, as you said, like see God or light. It was more like, whoa, yeah. this is really, really serious right now. I consider and that though too. So the, I, I think because we've done episodes on near-death experiences, I think there's lot like grades of it, right? So like you'll have the most severe ones are the ones where people have like a heart attack or their their heart stops and then they'll have this like crazy those are the people where it's like oh i met god or i met my dead relatives or you know the the stopping of the heart or the cardiac arrest ones are usually the ones that have that traditional archetypal experience that you hear about from you know the mystical uh communities um mine was close to that but i think the fact that my heart didn't stop was probably you know, a good thing. Obviously, I don't want that to happen. So I'm fine with how that went down. My mom had a traditional near death experience giving birth to my sister. She was dead for like a minute and a half or something like that. So she's got a crazy uh, story on that. But um, but to your point, you had a near death experience too. It was just you were close to death and you caught yourself or found a way out of it. You know, so I think there's just different types, you know, if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, most of the astral voyaging I've done has certainly come through high dose mushroom experiences, DMT, I think primarily those two. And I'm, I was always fascinated with high dose experiences ever since the very first one I had. And probably the most interesting thing was how comfortable I felt in a high dose experience. And I, I think that's atypical. I think maybe, you know, certain people are into it, but I remember like, I didn't have a scale and I wanted to do a five gram dose and I did seven grams because I, you know, you buy an eighth at a time. So I just like, Hey, I want to do five grams and okay, I'll, I'll take both of these. And then, uh, I, I felt extremely comfortable, even though it was a very ten intense experience. And then I doubled that at a certain point, like pretty early on, I was doing 14 gram solo doses and I, they, don't try this at home kids, you know, but there are certainly people who have a proclivity for the higher doses. And I felt totally isolated in that because even my friends who were psychonauts, nobody wanted to do a dose like that. What's the most, discovered, what's the most you've done? Uh, about 28 grams, like an ounce around there. Dried so like, or pretty, fresh? Dried. Yeah. Dried. dried. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. 15, I would say more often I've done. Yeah. It's between 15. That's and like, 20, Kal so. what's that? Kalindi Ali. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he, he really uh, vindicated for me a lot of those early experiences because they were incredible, extraordinary, baffling, but deeply meaningful and personally meaningful experiences. And there wasn't like a community for that. And then I discovered Kalindi Iyi and he's out there at breaking convention at universities, right, in England, talking about taking 30 grams or 40 grams and talking about navigating through these subatomic realities and extremely coherent and extremely lucid. And things he was talking about, I had experienced those already like a decade before. And then just in the funny way that life works, I got to go to breaking convention last year and be a keynote speaker with a bunch of academics, you know, an auditorium full of people. And Again, I, I feel a great sense of gratitude to be in this position now where for the longest time I wanted to talk about these things. I wanted to share about them. I wanted to explore them, but it just didn't fit into the culture. Right. And now the culture has sort of pivoted to everybody wants to talk about psychedelics and entheogens and tripping and this and that. And uh, I, I feel grateful to have had a lot of experiences and to have had to make sense of them in the Western world that we live in. Like a lot of people that I knew who were into this stuff, you know, they kind of stopped doing it for various reasons or kind of fell off the map because it's really tough to integrate a really uh, ecstatic visual visionary experience or whatever you want to call it. It's super tough to integrate that into business as usual and to, you know, go work your job where you're punching the clock and you're taking shit from the boss. So yeah, I had a good long run of like 15 plus years of figuring out how to do that. And like, you know, teaching high school, getting married, starting my own business. And, and I kind of chilled out after a while. Like I still have all the appreciation for psychedelics and often, you know, engage when the time is right for me. But like, 
I, I'm not, my life isn't guided by them anymore. Oftentimes, like people will give me a ton of stuff. They'll be like, bro, I want here, have this chocolate or this or that. I'm like, I'm going to be real with you. I just want to drink some beers and kick it. You know, I'm not trying to go on this crazy rabbit hole tonight. Like I'm trying to, you know, drink a couple beers and go watch a basketball game. And I think that's funny because uh, it's almost like I came full circle. You know, I used to be an athlete. I was a division one college athlete. And my big, like one of the big pet peeves at that moment was that nobody in sports culture was even remotely in interested in psychedelics. And I was this black sheep and like you get made fun of, you know, like, I still get made fun of by people who don't get it. You know, like, would you I play? Told, I, I played first base, dude. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. So I wasn't very fleet of foot. I definitely had a little speed, but I dude, was you're a very first base, bro. Contact yeah. hitter, bro. I never really developed the power. I was first I, base I, pitcher too, dude. You're exactly. Not fleet of I was foot, pitching yeah. too. And, um, that was one of those fortuitous twists of fate where I was pretty heavily recruited out of high school and I got recruited by like all these big programs. And then I remember I was going to go to like Stanford. I went to a camp and they're recruiting me and I just performed so poorly in the showcase. And then I went to University of San Francisco to a camp and just like everything lined up perfectly. Like all the pitches they threw, you know, in the scrimmages were fastballs down the middle. When I took the mound, I was on that day. And then boom, that's what lined up for me. And thinking back on it, I was like, what a hilarious sort of like cosmic joke that I could have gone to like Tennessee, I could have played at Vanderbilt or like, you know, University of Texas or something. And I ended up in San Francisco, like while I'm developing an interest in psychedelics and U.S. literally the first time I went up to go look at the campus, I, I called up one of my old uh, high school friends who was a freshman there when I was still a senior in high school. And she's like, hey, uh, you want to go smoke a bowl on campus and then we'll go get some food? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. Right. But uh, it was uh, not it didn't fit in with the whole red meat, alpha male, steroid, you know, sort of baseball jock culture, which I imagine you're familiar well, what's with. What's his face through a no hitter on uh, the hit Ellis. Ellis. Yeah. Ellis? Yeah. Yeah. Insane yeah, it can be done. Sense. can be done. I'm not a big alcohol guy. I know uh, there's plenty of dudes that were drunk too. Was it uh, David Well? Was it David Well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I think he was hammered during one. That. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, man, I mean, I, I, I love all that stuff. And I love those stories, too, because, you know, it's like I said, I can relate. I wasn't a Division One athlete, but I can relate a lot to that, having been, you know, an athlete and being into these things. And we were kind of the outcasts because we were in a jam band in high school. We also I also played football and lacrosse and hung out with those people. And, on the you know, we would go see fish and whatever jam band came locally or whatever when we were younger, too. So it was kind of like a weird... I was kind of friends with everybody. It was just kind of like a, a weird mix. Um, and uh, I think that that's kind of not a bad thing looking back. I, I, I'm glad that uh, I didn't just be like, oh, I'm a jock or, oh, I'm just a burnout or whatever. I think that, uh, you know, to your point, uh, these stereotypes are stupid, you know, for many reasons. But for the, the main one is uh, just pushing around these ideas that are just flawed. But, um, so you, you know, what, what's, what's some weirdness? Like, so I, this is what I wanted to talk about with you. So like, we talk a lot about like the metaphysics. So like we've had the wooest of the woo people on here and we've also had like scientists, you know, and I'll even try and get the scientists to, to get a little out there when they're on here. What, what are some of your ideas? Like you mentioned Terrence McKenna, Food of the Gods. Do you believe in the Stone Ape Theory or any aspect of it or like the visual acuity thing or the doubling or tripling of brain size, like anything like that? Or like what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that checks out for me. Honestly, it makes too much sense. Uh, how to conclusively prove it, it's probably impossible. But yeah, in my experiences, I've always felt uh, a deeper sense of verbal and mental acuity went on mushrooms and and when in the right headspace for that and a woo woo one for you i'll give you is my freshman year at usf i ate an eighth of mushrooms out at ocean beach with some friends sun was setting and then i decided to go back to campus and i didn't want to get on the bus or anything so i walked through all of golden gate park i was deep in the cuts like by the frisbee golf course you know like among the trees by myself following a path and i hear this really high-pitched oscillating frequency going beep beep like that and right away i was like that's not a sound i've ever heard before i got to figure out what's going on right now and i kept hearing it and i went off the path through these tufts of grass into the bushes and i traced it to its source and it was a family of mushrooms 
that I found. And that is one of those really woo-woo stories that uh, a number of things like that have happened to me. And Were they psychedelic time, or they were just mushrooms in general? I think they were, yeah. I mean, at the time, I didn't know much about ID or like, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, wild mushroom universe. But I have learned that there's a lot of people who go gorilla mushrooming where they'll take like super soakers full of uh, liquid culture and go out to wood chip piles or to various areas and inoculate them. And that was, you know, I one of the panels I recently went to at an event a while ago, they talked about how mushrooms want to be outside. Like doing them in sterile conditions is not the natural way that mushrooms were grown. It is one way, but like they can totally grow outside. And interestingly enough, trichoderma, which is contam, right? It's like if you're trying to grow mushrooms, everybody gets trike. Nobody wants to talk about it, but especially when you're beginning, you get contam, it screws up your whole growth. That's only because they're in this ultra sterile indoor environment. When they're in the outdoors, Trike doesn't really threaten them because they develop a stronger immune system where they have to compete against a bunch of different potential contaminants. So all that to say that I'm quite confident it was a, a species of psychoactive mushroom. And um, I'm pretty sure, I mean, that's my experience. And I had to stop talking about that kind of stuff for the longest time because people just laugh in your face. And like, you know, it's kind of, you're like, hey, I want to share this really profound thing that happened to me. Uh, I, like, I believe I you, bro. Claws, in fact, I feel like I've heard that noise before that you were just saying, but it, I feel like it ended up being a frog when I investigated <laughs> it. But, well, that's, uh, that's fun too when that happens, yeah. the bait and switch, right? But yeah, I mean, that's one. And I, there's a lot of interesting things going on. I don't claim to have very good answers for what they are, but I've certainly had a lot of contact with entities as many people have who have done high dose mushrooms yeah or DMT so or that's why i wanted to ask you about there was a there's been some debates on like acts i'm sure you see there's one between andrew gallimore and some other younger uh scientists okay yeah, know, yeah, yeah that i think that was the guy um and uh you know i don't i don't like dogmatism either way i don't like when people are like oh i for sure know what's going on and i don't like when people are like you know, completely the opposite either. I like, I like you mentioned earlier, kind of in the middle on a lot of things. I kind of am too. Like, I feel like there's no truth on the fringes. It's just the way that it pushes the boundaries out so we can get a better look at the forest, if you will. Um, so what's your take on that? Do you think that the entities are part of our subconscious? Do you think they're just visual hallucinations? Like, what do you think's happening? So I, don't really concern myself with the details. I, I really appreciate mystery. I think that's something that rubs me the wrong way about a lot of academia is trying to like over reduce everything to, you know, the sum of its parts. When in reality, for me, like this idea of a mystery that for all of this, you know, intense technology and scrutiny that we have and the capabilities of our species, we have zero idea what happens before birth, what happens after death, you know, these basic questions. And maybe we'll get there at some point, but I'm not holding my breath. For me, it's not the point to try to like reduce this, right? The point is to enjoy it, to have fun. And with psychedelics, for me, it's like, did it improve your life in some way? Like if you had this experience and it made you uh, a more chill person, you know, less prone to overreact, that's a huge net W, no matter if the entity was inside of you or outside of you. Yeah, I'm curious, but like, I, you know, I'm not a, an expert on these things, but I'll give you a couple of other interesting examples of things that happened to me. Maybe it was me telling myself this, but I used to sleep with mushrooms next to my head, like without even consuming them. I just like when I, you know, you hold some psilocybin mushrooms in your hand, you pretty often, at least in my case, you, you feel something there, like there's really something going on there. So I thought, oh, it'll be interesting if I just put this in my pillowcase and sleep near it. And one night, maybe even the first night I did that, I had two very succinct, complete phrases whispered into my ear, like, like as if you said them to me. And I still carry those phrases in the way I navigate the world. And one of them was create answers, not expectations. And it's like such a simple, profound statement where it's like so much of anxiety, depression, problems in my own life was because I had all these grandiose expectations and then reality didn't conform to them. So then I'm bummed out. So this idea of like, don't have too many expectations, just create answers, just go do the thing instead of like overanalyzing. And, and so that was one. And then the other one was lose the loser attitude. And again, it's just kind of like a funny, pithy, you know, succinct way 
I'm saying uh, you're victimizing yourself here. Like you don't have to be moping around, you know, endlessly listening to the same sad songs and overplaying, you know, replaying the same traumatic incidents in your head. But where those came from, I have no idea, but I'm super grateful that I received those. And I certainly attribute them to having the mushrooms whisper them to me. And if that makes me a wook, well, I'm here for all the wookness then. Yeah, I mean, again, we all, I have, we did a whole trip report series, so I won't get into too much, but I've had weird, so I had like a couple that are very heavily themed on why mushrooms contain psilocybin and the, the answer I kept getting was uh, to protect the earth. So like this idea, like I don't think it's that, I think it's archetypal in the sense that, but like one of them was before when I was younger, before you know, the idea of like the Terrence McKenna machine elf indoctrinating your mind or mind virus or something like that wouldn't apply for my first trip because it was bef that experience was before social media, before people talking about this kind of stuff and everything. So um, that's the weird thing. And I recently had on a animal pharmacologist on and we were discussing why, you know, psilocybin and different species of mushrooms contain psilocybin. And he didn't have a great answer either. And he's like, don't, you know, like the idea of like it being insects or to repel insects, you know, yeah, that maybe, but probably not, you know? So, um, I find that mysterious and, you know, people love getting together in groups and I don't know, maybe I'm a weirdo. Maybe I'm like a, you know, in a past life, I was like a hermit or something, but I don't like the idea of doing these big, huge group circles and integrations and things like that um i'm a i'm an i'm a thinker i'm an idea guy i love silent darkness meditation uh, being alone with my thoughts um a thousand percent i couldn't agree with you more there yeah i i don't, I don't understand the i mean i guess i get it and especially if there's like a ceremonial aspect to it and you have to be there for that aspect of it or whatever but i choose to like one, and I haven't done it in a while, but like, you know, years ago, silent darkness, I would get messages. And like one time I was taken through history through like ancient Greece and like, you know, the Lucini mysteries and all these different things. And not like woo woo, like um, kind of some of the stuff that's out there, but just more of Long's line, like people have been using these things and um, there it's the realm of imagination, but things can be taken from that realm of imagination and brought into this realm of physicality. And that's where you get like great ideas or great inventions or, you know, whatever, something along those lines. And if you look at like the history of how things have evolved in like through tech or through, you know, breakthroughs in science and things like that, a lot of that stuff is kind of connected. So I do think that there is something there. I, I mean, maybe if it's even just breaking out of the day-to-day -day consciousness and then being able to tap into something else or you're a different part of your creativity. Dude, I got to share with you another uh, mysterious, baffling, uh, ecstatic experience I had, which was the first time I went to Maria Sabina's house in 2010. And I was doing a road trip from... Oaxaca down to Costa Rica with some friends. So we had a Jeep. We had been reading Reality Sandwich at the time. And I think there was an article about it. And I was familiar with Maria Sabina. And I just put two and two together. Like, oh, we're in Oaxaca right now. We have a car. We have like multiple weeks of an open-ended road trip. Let's go see if we can find this place. And there were no foreigners there whatsoever. I don't know exactly what it's like today. I was there a few years ago. But there was not a single foreigner we saw there. We get in there and we all speak Spanish, which is very helpful, you know. And my buddy just asked a little kid, he's like, hey, we'll give you like five bucks or 100 pesos if you can take us to Maria Sabina's house. And he jumps in the car. He takes us up there. We go and we introduce ourselves. And, you know, we're pretty personable people. And we're just like, hey, we're just really interested. Uh, if it's OK, we'd love to learn or visit. But like, we're also happy to leave. No problem. And then they were like, no, you can stay the night if you want. You want to hang out with us? We've got a guest room here. We're like, yeah, I paid three dollars, three dollars for each of us to stay in this amazing little homestead with this crazy view. And then uh, they asked us, do you want to do a ceremony? And we're like, of course. So they're like, okay, well, it's not the rainy season yet. So we're going to have to go get some because as we were saying earlier, like it's not as omnipresent, at least historically, until there was more demand as people would think. So, you know, they're like, yeah, we're, we're going to have to go get some. We'll do it tomorrow. So I'm like, all right, cool. So we stayed there. And then that first night, so 
not even having ingested anything. I was in bed and then I woke up with one eye paralyzed. It was completely paralyzed. I couldn't blink it. I couldn't move it. And I was still asleep. So I had my one eye just trained on the ceiling. And I remember thinking, I'm insane. I've gone insane. This isn't real. What is happening? And I, I basically had sleep paralysis, no control over my body. And then in my dream, I was blacked out in an airport and I was getting arrested. And I was like in a bathroom, slipping on a bunch of like shit and piss on the ground, getting arrested while my other eye is awake, looking at the ceiling, paralyzed. And that was one of those, like I had to recognize, okay, whatever I'm into here is a little bit out of my depth. I have no frame of reference for this. I have no idea how powerful this is. And I remember just thinking, okay, I recognize how powerful whatever the force is here, it is. And I'm visiting here and please, uh, please let me go. And then I <laughs> was able to open my eyes after that. It could have been a minute. It could have been 10 minutes. It's hard to tell, you know, in a state like that. Nothing like that has ever happened before or since. And uh, one of those really confounding mind escape experiences that people have. Yeah, that sounds crazy. It sounds like you were having half your brain was having a dream or a nightmare. And then the other half was like uh, just normal awake. It's that far out there. Kind of sounds like. What, uh, yeah, very bizarre. Um, I've thought about that. I think I brought that up to this concept up to who was it? You know, Peter Sherstead Hughes. Uh, yeah. 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 He was on, I think we were talking and I thought of this at like, so you know how like they say energy is not created nor destroyed. So like, what if when we break down, let's say there is some fundamental level of consciousness within particles or, you know, matter of us or whatever that goes somewhere. Right. So like maybe when you tap into those realms, that's kind of what you're tapping into is something, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, there is other consciousness or throughout time there's, been millions of consciousnesses and that's what kind of you're interacting with at that point. I don't know. I was just thinking that, or possibly maybe that's what's feeding into the psychedelics themselves. Like maybe not like a soul per se, anything like that, but just like a level of consciousness. Yeah. And to, to round that thought out, I actually went back. So I didn't even talk about the ceremony, which I don't prefer to always talk about those things, you know, uh, but I went back 10 years later and that was like 2021 or so, maybe 11 years later. And uh, they remembered me, or at least they said they did. You know, we were chatting. They're like, oh yeah, I remember you guys. And uh, same thing. So I stayed for a couple nights there and I have some other connections in the area now. And uh, I remember I had such a profound experience the time before I kind of thought, yeah, it's going to happen again. And then I did the ceremony. They call it a velada and they've got copal smoke and there's, it's syncretized, right? So there's like a Christian element to it where there's like the cross. Actually, over near their house, there's a Catholic church with a bunch of psilocybin mushrooms painted on it, which is super awesome. I've got some photos of it. Yeah, very interesting situation. But those elements are ritualized into the ceremony where they're praying and they're blowing the smoke and all that. And then I was like two hours, three hours in, not a whole lot was happening. And I was just like, that's cool. Like, you know, I, I was hoping to get this big, profound experience, but I recognize I'm not entitled to it. And then I thought, you know, I, I'm going to make use of this time and start thinking about some satirical plot lines, because that was like right around the time when I was starting to make a lot of psychedelic satire. And then as soon as I started on that wavelength, then I started getting hit with all these different like rapid succession of hilarious plot lines. And I got this sense of validity that like the mushrooms or whatever you want to call it there really liked that sort of jester clown element. And it was almost like you come here, you crazy gringo trying to see the answers to the universe. And in reality, like we just want to pitch you some funny ass plot lines and laugh. And that was like a real sense of validation there to be like, wow, I'm in what some people could call like the holy of holies and uh, the most uplifting, you know, beautiful experience here is just coming up with these little one line plots for videos I'm going to make. And uh, I just always thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, that is funny. I mean, but look, um, you're passionate about it and you're creative. So like, again, that's what, why wouldn't that happen there? Right. I mean, that's kind of how I think about it. You know, I'm sure I would have my weird, you know, uh, mind exercises or thought exercises or whatever. Think about weird shit. If I was in the same circumstances, actually. So we did 
like a four part series on like sacred mushroom rituals with, I don't know if you know who this author is, but Tom Lane who wrote this book called sacred mushroom rituals, a search for the blood of Quetzalcoatl. Uh, and he went down and met, um, and did ceremonies with Maria Sabina in the seventies. Um, and wrote a book about his experiences with her and her family. Um, and he took us through, you know, he tried to understand the metaphysics uh, as well as possible within their culture, the Mazatec and the Toltec and the, um, you know, a lot of the Mesoamerican stuff. And we went through like the Vienna codices. I mean, we did slideshows on the stuff. I don't know what episodes they were like 74 or 75, something like that. So it was like early on, but he took us through, um, uh, basically like their metaphysics and how they think about these things. And it is completely different. Like they're from like the way we think about philosophy and metaphysics in the Western world, if you want to call it that versus, uh, the Mesoamerican metaphysics and the way they look at life and everything like that. So very interesting stuff. Um, I love hearing about the Maria Sabina stuff because, you know, somebody like that, she's a Sabia that was like born to do that you know like they have that in them where they're just this healer you know um it's kind of interesting to me um and i don't feel like do we do we still have those you know like where where are these people um are they still within these indigenous communities have they, you know that's something i think about too and and on top of is this corporadelic stuff are you know <laughs> our mysteries or our uh initiation kind of a thing and if that is that's sad because i feel like that's missing the whole point right yeah interestingly enough i think there are quite a few cultures and traditions that maintain unbroken lineages of different entheogenic rituals and as an example of that i had mudu baki on the podcast a while ago and he was a an adherent of kalindi Iyi and worked with him extensively and went to Africa four times with Kalindi on various research trips where they visited different tribal societies that Kalindi had built connections with over the years. And he told me that he's seen two different occasions where they had ritualized use of psychoactive mushrooms in Africa. There's no text or research or anything about that. I've seen one peer reviewed paper or one research paper where somebody mentioned having connected with somebody, I want to say in Sierra Leone, but don't quote me on that, who had knowledge of the mushrooms, but it's heavily gate kept because of things like what happened with the Mazatec, where after the word got out, then they get overrun and stormed. And then the next thing you know, it creates all kinds of conflict. And that's certainly happening to a degree still in present day uh, areas of Latin America or Mesoamerica that yeah, I mean, there's a huge demand for it now. And that extends to things like the 5-MeO-DMT and the frog, where, uh, as far as I understand, it was not really historically ritually used in a lot of the different cultures or societies. So, and yeah, so so that one's weird because, uh, you know, uh, Hamilton went did a deep dive and he f found the first person to do it was this Nelson guy. Um, he retracted it. He thought it was this Albert guy at first Savarini or something like that and then he had to retract it and it was this other guy did a whole thing on it but I I did come across a paper that a friend she's called like she's got a YouTube channel check her out the megalith hunter she lives on Malta but she you know she was looking into the Olmecs and the Olmecs do have I think there is some archaeological evidence that they there's depictions of the toad and possibly even, you know, something there, um, entheogen wise. So, I mean, I got to do a little bit more research, but I think that there's probably the Olmecs, which is a Mesoamerican, um, culture, I, I believe did probably either know about it or maybe something adjacent. It's certainly not my area of expertise, but I, have have learned that because of the demand now and the interest that it has spurred a lot more harvesting and a lot more of use in communities that typically didn't necessarily have a connection to it and i find that very fascinating and another thing along those lines is that uh, on the subject of southern mexico that's the only place in the world where salvia grows endemically the type of salvia that is smoked yeah there's sage and there's you know various types of salvia but the salvinorum divinorum right mm -hmm. that is only found in one pocket of the world and very interestingly 
one of its primary uses was for divination. And I find that very fascinating. Now, as many people who have smoked salvia, like we mentioned earlier, used to be able to buy it at gas stations or smoke shops. And I always like to joke about that and be like, literally back in 10th grade, 11th grade, me and the boys would pull up and be like, let me get some monster energy drinks, some Slim Jims and some 120X salvia entheogen to go get zooted in the parking lot. Oh, that's nuts. Yeah, I think the highest, I think the most was like 25 or 30x yeah yeah well um the first no i'm saying i'm saying the the most i've done i can't even imagine doing 120x based on what i did at like 30x i don't don't know if i did 120x but i certainly have done 60x and i'm quite sure i've done 120 but i smoked it outside of a starbucks believe it or not and it was i broke two chairs just by sitting perfect place to do it (laughs) setting this is like you know dumb suburban kids out there who had it, you, have, you know, nobody's out there. And uh, I remember like literally being on the ground being like, what happened? They're like, you broke the chair. I'm like, what did I do? They're like, you didn't do anything. You just sat in it too hard. And then I, they picked me up, and put me in another chair. And then I broke that chair too. So like this sense of like, people talk about salvia making you like really heavy or like gravity is on you. I guess that's a testament to that. But one thing I wanted to mention about salvia that's quite interesting is I have friends who cultivate it now and they chew it. And I have actually not really experienced this, but apparently that's a much more sensible way to do it. Cause when you smoke it, it's super disorienting. You know, I don't know anybody who's out here being like, oh, I love salvia. It's great. Pretty much everyone who tries it is like, what the hell just happened? That was so confusing and utterly confounding. But this sense of like being able to chew it. And I've heard again, Everybody do your own due diligence. Don't just listen to a random wook on the internet, but like 15 leaves, fresh leaves in your cheek, that'll get you there, but it'll get you there in a way where you can appreciate it and frame it and and process it. Whereas with smoking 120 or 60 or whatever, is not going to get you anywhere except for breaking a few chairs and, you know, looking like fuzzy static is filling up your field of vision. No, you're dead on. I remember having this exact conversation. We had Andrew Gallimore on and we were discussing salvia because he was talking about, you know, how they have the extended DMT, you know, experiment that they're doing now. Uh, There's somebody uh, proposed like a extended salvia one where it's like salvinorin B, methoxy, methyl, you know, like all this crazy, basically you know, going on a 30 minute salvia trip, which sounds insane to me. I smoked it in high school and maybe a little couple times in college and wasn't my thing. I mean, I had a couple fractally, like you said, gravity falling on like beanbag chairs and just being, you know, repeat mode and all sorts of weird stuff. But, um, to your point, there is, and I hate, I I'll keep referencing because I think this dude does good stuff, but Hamilton Morris did an episode where he goes down to, you know, where you're talking about Hualta, um, and, uh, does the, the whole thing. They, they blend up the leaves. He drinks it, does nothing. He makes quids in like a ceremony setting and puts it in his mouth to chew it and masticates it like you're talking about and has what he calls one of his best trips of all time. So, um, and then I asked Andrew Gallimore and he said, so it's, it's, you want to take it that way because, um, it's not that it lasts longer or, or whatever. It's every time your your you know uh, receptors, your sublingual receptors, and everything come in contact with the compounds that you're masticating, it keeps reigniting it. So you're just keeping you know the whole thing going. And it seemed like when Hamilton Morris did that on his episode, like you said, it was one of like wow, that looks awesome. I, I, that looks nothing like my salvia trips, you know. Um, and then he goes and to the guy, you know, that making YouTube videos smoking out of a bong. And that guy is just like, you know, they're showing people crawling out of windows and break, you know, jumping through windows and all sorts of crazy stuff. So at least one of those videos. Yeah. Very recently. yeah. So, yeah. So to your point, I mean, it's 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 probably like doing ayahuasca versus smoking DMT. Right. In terms of like a, an analogy. That sounds good to me. Sounds as good of an analogy as I could come up with. Well, I, I will tell you, I have never done DMT. Like I said, I was offered it once in my life. So, and I'm too old now to be playing, uh, you know, alchemist, at least with that. Um, they're, they're in a, I feel very lucky that I got to have a lot of my initial psychedelic experiences when I was quite young, very stable minded and um, quite healthy physically, et cetera. And in a place where it was quite accepted, you know, being in San Francisco, being around the hate, it was kind of weird if you weren't into those things, right? It was the norm, it was normalized. And 
that was prior to social media for me too. So like, I really had to form my own relationship with a lot of these things and kind of decide for myself. The Arrowhead forums, of course, were a huge godsend for so many of us budding psychonauts. And then I got to close the loop on that at Psychedelic Science in Denver this summer by introducing Earth and Fire Arrowhead on the stage I was emceeing. So that was a super cool moment. And then I got to kick it with Earth Arrowhead later at the hotel lobby. And what an awesome person. And those are my type of psychonauts or trippers. Like, you know, you're interesting, you're engaging. And I think Madison Margolin talks about this, who I've interviewed on my podcast, and she's a wonderful writer about like, taking a bunch of psychedelics does not make you psychedelic, you know? And I think there's this like, um, we need a calibration with that to be like, some of the most trippy psychedelic people I know they might have shut the book on their experiences years ago and figured out how to, you know, live an interesting, colorful, meaningful life. And that's my end goal. My end goal is not to have tripped more than you or have done more grams or whatever. Like, yeah, bro, if, like more hundreds of times, dog. That's it, man. Like, I want to have a happy life, you know, a, a normal, uh, to, I'm pretty normal, man. But like, you know, I, I'm not a trying to win the race for like the biggest psychonaut at this point right but dude I do you're feel grateful. dude you're winning it bro you're not trying to you're you are yeah, winning it dude, right now I, I i am definitely still a psychonaut um but you know it is it is true like i was just visiting family for 10 days and i had like lots of opportunities people i hadn't seen in a while who wanted a trip i was like win bro like I'm, I'm going out to dinner i'm going out to barbecues i'm hanging out with my friends kids like what am i going to just like take a night off to go do this full send and uh it, it's funny though you know i i do believe in like you know you you do what's right for you and like i'm not going to tell anyone they shouldn't be microdosing or you know joining a ceremony or whatever but like i also feel a little bit like i've graduated from trying to you know map the whole psychedelic universe every minute of the day and uh, I can't wait. Like tomorrow, spring training starts. I'm pumped to go watch the Padres, cheer them on for spring training, and uh, you know, eat my two gram uh, THC edibles. That's another thing, man. People are be they, they're making like the strongest weed these days, and I can't get behind it, man. Like, good for you if you're on it, but like, I like low dose. Oh, you know, dude, I got a story about that. Weed. When yeah. uh, when stuff was still kind of illegal, so I just moved back to the Detroit area and everything's super cheap, super amazing here. Um, but when I was living in Chicago, it became recreationally legal like a couple of years ago, but obviously, I mean, I've spoken whatever and I lived in Chicago for 20 years. Um, <laughs> so my buddy had got, you know, some stuff sent from Washington and that's when it was legal there and not there. And, uh, I remember he got a, uh, a cinnamon roll and he gave me the cinnamon roll. So, I was supposed to eat like part of this thing. I ate the whole thing, dude. The butter spoiled. I was hallucinating and shitting my pants at the same time. It was like the worst f fucking. And he's like, oh, dude, there was a quarter in there. You shouldn't have eaten the whole thing. I'm like, okay, well, you know, and now it's like I could eat. I haven't in a while. Like I haven't done anything crazy since my son was born. But before that, I could eat like five, 600 milligrams and be. Ooh. But that's when you were, if you consistently like take it, it's not like if, if you took, told me to take like a month off, I wasn't going to take like 600 milligrams then, you know, or whatever. Now I can take 10, 20 and go to bed, you know, whatever. But, um, but yeah, I mean, at one point, and we did an episode where I was on like two or 300, I think, um, like a secret episode where we're just getting out of our minds. Um, I love but, it. I almost yeah. took some Rick Simpson oil before this, but I was like, I want to be semi coherent. <laughs> it's like, like you, <laughs> the first time I ever ate an edible was a huge weed pancake in China and Leaping Tiger Gorge, which is in the very south near Lijiang, the city. And I was on this day trip, went up to a monastery, and I was with my parents. I was a senior in high school. My brother was studying in Hong Kong, and we did a little trip over through China. And I was under the impression at the time that like weed and drugs, et cetera, are extremely, you know, draconianly prohibited in China, which they to a degree are. I get to this monastery. My dad goes, Dennis, is that a cannabis plant? I'm like, whoa, they're all over the hillside. It's like once you see one, then you're like, whoa. I was going to say, that's where it comes it. from, the Tibetan and it's Asian plateaus. All over and then uh, I asked the monks if they use the, the plants and he goes, oh, one of the monks through a translator said they make an oil from the seeds and they lather themselves up in this cannabis oil. 
And I'm sure they probably have other uses for as well. But then there's a restaurant maybe half an hour away up in the gorge. And I saw on the menu, on the, you know, they have the English menu. And on the last page, they have this super obvious stoner face. And it says, if you want your food to be made happy, it's an extra dollar or whatever the equivalent was in Yuan. And uh, so I, I was with my parents and they're not into any of that stuff. So I peeled off from the table and I went and caught the waiter. I was like, I want this and give me it over here. And I got this huge pancake and you know you see all the weed in it and we're surrounded by weed i had no idea what an edible was like i had no idea that it had a delayed onset i had only smoked up until that point so i ate the whole pancake and then nothing happened and i was like oh it's bunk weed oh nothing nothing to write home about that's kind of lame but it wasn't very expensive whatever we're sitting in the car like an hour later driving down the mountain and it just hit me bro and like the, the guy has you know chinese music playing and i'm into it and then i see he's got one English language cassette and it's a Led Zeppelin cassette. I was like, can we put the Zepp on? He's like, yeah, we put it in. We're like driving through the hills of China, baked out of my mind on a cinnamon roll situation, listening to Stairway to Heaven. And then, you know, I, I don't think I was not high for like two days. And I remember going to dinner later that night, couldn't open my eyes. My mom's like, what's wrong with your eyes? I was like, I got jet lag. She's like, we've been here for two weeks. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, people don't realize, and like we just did an episode 301 with Chris Bennett. He's like a cannabis historian. And, you know, we're talking about like Telerad and the, you know, Israeli temple where they found hash oil and, um, you know, it's connection to Soma and all that stuff. I don't think people realize too, like how potent it can be. Um, I remember... So we, we went to see Umphreys McGee, I think it was like 2005, 2006 at the Riviera Theater um, in Chicago. Or was it the Riviera Theater? Yeah, I think it was the Riviera Theater. Like I, I saw Umphreys like a bunch of years in a row for New Year's when I lived in Chicago because they always played Chicago. And I remember my buddy giving my other buddy, his wife, a brownie made from like Trinity Bud and it's like sick from Cali. And, you know, these brownies are awesome. So she eats it and she... She starts to flip out. She's like, what did you dose me with? What did you put in here? And she's like flipping out. And then my other buddy's getting pieces. She's like, what did you do? It's like, dude, it's just bud. Like, this is just edibles. Like, well, nobody did anything. Like, why would I waste anything like that on that anyways? You know, like, so like, I don't think people realize like you can, you can overdo it for sure. And these stories of these people that have never done anything and then doing like a high dose is totally believable because if you don't know what you're doing, there's people that do know what they're doing that have those experiences too. maybe not react the same way, but you know what I'm saying? A thousand percent. I am a lightweight. I've been a stoner for many years and one bowl, one hit goes a long way for me. And it took me a long time to figure out how people have different brain chemistry and different physiology. Cause like, you know, I got friends who are eating a hundred milligrams at a time and then they're rolling blunts and all that. And then I'll take like one or two hits and I'm incapacitated socially after that. And, uh, but I thought that was just like how I had to fit in for the longest time. So it did take me a while to figure out like I can decline the blunt just because especially like in Southern California, you know, there's this sort of oh, like, dude, I, I can't smoke. I, I can't smoke yeah. blunts, bro. If somebody hands me a blunt, I, no offense. I just, I can't smoke. I don't want that tobacco. I don't want that smell. Um, I don't like cigars. I don't want any of that, you know? Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I do love good glass culture though. Like should, give me a, a sick, you know, hand blown dab rig or bong or whatever. I love that. But yeah, blunts. It's so intense, dude. But like, hey, whatever floats your boat, you know, whatever people are into. But like, I love a good outdoor plant, like a single plant. That's kind of where I'm at as far as the whole possibility of getting involved or more involved with doing, you know, policy stuff or being in, you know involved with legislative frameworks is like, I don't know how I feel about the like whole industry of like trying to commercialize and sell, you know, these huge amounts of mushrooms for people. Like if people want to do that, then you do that. But like, I think uh, one cannabis plant for me, or, you know, uh, produces as much as I need. Uh, one home grow for me of mushroom produces as much as I need. And I do appreciate that there are people doing, you know, above and beyond going above and beyond. But uh, to me, the idea of trying to like, criminalize or not move swiftly to effect sensible policy where uh, a adult human who makes their own decisions uh, cannot smoke or cannot grow one cannabis plant or cannot grow one uh, shoebox of mushrooms or Dude, the fact there, that alcohol is legal absurd. the fact that alcohol is legal in cannabis <clears throat> is, is the biggest crock of shit of all time i mean it's just if you look at like yeah 
things can happen when people smoke cannabis and I'm sure there's people that do dumb shit. But the amount of people that I know that have died in car accidents from alcohol or wrapped their car around a fucking tree or done some fucked up shit on on alcohol far <laughs> out, out, you know, or ruin their own liver in their life or whatever, you know, like I, I know people that have died from like liver cancer and cirrhosis, you know, so it's like the fact that those, and I don't know anybody, you know, I'm sure they'll come out with studies and tests eventually here now that there's a little bit more access, but I don't know anybody that's had any health difficulties from cannabis as far as I, you know, what's out there in the literature and people that I've talked to. Yeah, I think there's a lot of extremely brilliant people who have lived very long, healthy lives if they're focusing on those avenues. You know, inevitably people uh, might want to explore other things and like, you know, the whole opiates, that's another story, right? But like, yeah, opiates, uh, alcohol, et cetera, somehow uh, alcohol managed to evade the Controlled Substances Act. Like not only is it legal, it's not scheduled anywhere on the act where cannabis is up there at number one still for the, the time being. And obviously I'm preaching to the choir here and there are still people arguing in favor of prohibition for whatever reason. But to me, it all comes back to cognitive liberty of uh, it's my right as a human being to have a relationship with nature. Uh, the idea of a uh, criminal plan or an illegal plan is completely obnoxious we That's have the another... receptors why did we evolve the receptors if there wasn't some sort of you know relationship yeah. there either at some point or meant to be not meant to be <sighs> but like the idea of creating compounds out of nowhere or synthesizing things to replicate nature instead we could just use nature you know and and to be honest with you I, this is one thing before we you know we can start to wrap it up here soon but one thing i wanted to talk about too is <clears throat> this idea that you know there's people that push back on like the mystical aspects or people that have these like crazy mystical trips or we were talking about like dmt elves and things like that as somebody with you know the the issues that i had the ocd it was the mystical aspects i think that were comforting and that allowed me to kind of take a step back. Um, there's something about the mystery and the, the magic of it that, you know, you said something about like, you don't want to know everything that's behind the veil or whatever. And I think I kind of agree with that. I think this idea that nothing, there's nothing more than what's here. This is a physical world and these are all just hallucinations and whatever. That's not going to help you know, the, the process, in my opinion, because I do think that a component of it is psychological, whether it's placebo or whatever, there is something to the, the mystical elements of it. And, you know, we're losing this idea that there's something bigger than us. I think it was Socrates or if you want to call it Plato, um, who said that, you know, it's, it's a dangerous thing or men become dangerous when they have something they don't they no longer have something greater than themselves meaning that whether it's a god or you know maybe the universe is conscious just believing that there's something greater than yourself is so is just so I don't know if it's necessary but it's just something that's so ingrained in us that when people lose that they kind of lose their way and I feel like we're seeing a lot of that out there right now where people just think that this is it. And everybody's scrambling to make it, you know, the best that they can or whatever. But in reality, I do think that there's some part of us that longs for this recognition of something greater, if that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the mystery. I think that was uh, categorically has been my uh, takeaway from a lot of psychedelics is that this is beautiful. What we're getting to do with our life and this experience, like even the most mundane aspects of it super beautiful and trying to like break that down and describe it. Like I'll leave that to someone else, dude. I'm having a great time. Uh, you know, I love to make people laugh. I love to find beauty. And even when I, you know, I'm pretty deeply cynical and sarcastic and, um, I, I choose to try to transubstantiate that into humor and laughter through poignant satire rather than sitting around being bitter about the, you know, the state of the world is a little bit volatile and chaotic right now. I think that, this idea of like, yeah, we're all getting back to normal. It's like that shit. It's the first sale, time bro. in history it's ever been like this, bro. It is absolutely an interesting time to be alive. And uh, I, I think that the simple things like uh, having a good laugh with your friends, 
that's also one of the most cathartic therapeutic aspects of psychedelics. Like you don't have to be in there looking for a therapeutic experience. Like I, I tripped a number of weeks ago and saw a meme. It was like on my way back, you know, I like to try to not have my phone involved in any capacity, but I remember just like, seeing this meme and I could not control my laughter, you know? And I was like, I was like, that was so therapeutic right there. Where it's like, you ever been in, you know, that situation where it's just like, uh, it was nighttime, my wife's sleeping and I'm like crying of laughter of this dumb, like dog meme I saw hugely therapeutic. Right. And I think that this idea that like, we have to be so solemn and serious and you have to go to a qualified professional who's going to put you in this room and do it this way and that way. Great. If you want to roll out all the clinical data and studies and all that to prove that that works for someone, cool, go for it. But like, uh, also know that there's a tremendous amount of therapeutic potential just in uh, laughter and and finding some some joy in something. Uh, and yeah, if you can reconnect with that, which for me, it's joyful to know that I don't have to be in control all the time. I don't have to like solve all the world's mysteries and. I like to develop comedy. Dude, I try, well. bro. I, I try to solve them and you'll it's never, fun, you you'll never, it's it. fun. You'll never solve them. But that's, that's, I think the acknowledgement of like, oh, I'll never have all these answers, but I'm going to try. I think that there's something to that too. You know, like there's a, yeah, it's a game or something. I don't know. But, um, so is there anybody that you haven't interviewed that you want to interview or is there anybody you haven't connected with yet that you're trying to or something like that? Like I always ask people like, you know, that are doing something similar because uh, we've had a lot of cool people on the show, but then there's people that I haven't been able to connect with, you know, like, is there anybody that you are trying to get on? Yeah. Off the top of my head, I'd love to make more inroads into the Twitter community, the academic community. I don't know how a lot of them feel about me. I've met a lot of them, but like I'm very much doing my own thing in my own lane, but I pride myself on being a comprehensive and well-studied host. And when I do the podcast, the roles are reversed and I like to ask good questions. I like to ask them things that are not just so canned, you know, like, uh, and that's often feedback I get where they're like, wow, you did your homework on this and you held court very well. So I'd like to make more inroads with these academics. I have one coming out tomorrow with Rana Hashimi, who's a PhD candidate at Stanford, who's studying uh, harm reduction and drug policy for youth, essentially, uh, so drug education for youth. So that'll be interesting. And funny story, I had Paul Stamets in the queue and we we're going to do it in person in England. And it was actually their request. We were there together. I've you know, met him a number of times and been on various projects. And then he was like, hey, um, I'm going to come to this room. You want to meet me there at this time? I was like, oh, hell yeah, I'm going to get Paul Stamets on the podcast. And then he came to the room and then he was like, dude, I'm just so tired. I've been doing interviews all day. And I was like, yeah, I get it. I'm not going to like force your <laughs> You're going to say, here, dude, but... I'm tripping so hard. I can't do this. Right now. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, that would be a fun one to do. Well, he's on my list. He's on my list. I haven't had him on. He's on one, you know, I've... Uh... I don't know if I've sent the emails. I've sent the emails to probably a lot of people, but I'd love to do one with Zach Leary. I talked to him about it as well. And he knew Michael Preneur. He's familiar. And he's like, yeah, I'll do it. And then right after the Wonderland conference in Miami this year, my Instagram got taken down. And it was one of those kind of bullshit things where it's like, no warning, no content strikes. I did literally nothing different than I've been doing. Oh, I and see I it every day, bro. It's 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 an yeah. epidemic with the psychedelic, the glass, even the glass community. Even if you show a sick piece of glass or you just made whether it's going to be dabbed out of or not, like it should be able to be seen by the world, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't lose too much sleep over it. I got right back on top of it and I recognize like, it's not my platform. Like I'm on their platform. It could be totally unfair. I'm still the one using their service. So, but that was kind of like my network. And especially after these larger events, you know, you get to have in person conversations with people and then they follow you and this and that. So I had like three at least people that I wanted to ex like specifically interview that I talked to. They said they were down, we were connected, they followed me and then the Instagram got taken down. And uh, But I would love to have Zach Leary on. I think he'd be, you know, really interesting person to with all of his life experiences and um there's so many more and I, I hope to make it to 303 episodes like you're at right now. I'm at about 150 somewhere around there. I, I don't really keep track of these things, but I, I need to start doing it. And I kind of have always thought I will just sort of make the path as I'm walking. And it, it's funny, you know, like Michael Preneur has got a kind of crazy amount of traction in the last year. And I have like very little organizational prowess, you know, like as far as like being able to be uh, on top of things and run it like a business. Like I'm in the process of going through some of those steps to like, 
you know, because these cool opportunities keep coming. We're like, damn, I have to like get my matrix mentality dialed in and get it all going. But uh, I, I kind of feel like I'm going to get it over time. You know, I'm three years in now. I hope to be doing it for six years or for 10 years. Or oh, as yeah, long dude, as it, you will. But you're obviously right? passionate about it. You'll be doing it. And shout out to Sandy, top escapee. She's one turned me on to your stuff. Love you, Sandy. Thanks, Sandy. Um, Usually appreciate it. <laughs> No, but I, I like what you're doing, man. Just keep doing it. Keep making the videos. Keep making, you know, and they're, obviously this is something that's going to be evolving. And look, what you're doing, you don't need there to be corporate delics or whatever. Psychedelics are super interesting. Like, you know, there's an infinite amount of things you could talk about within that realm, right? You know, uh, the metaphysics, the science, the, you know, there's just the the business aspects of it, which you've you know, highlighted in your satire, which I love that stuff. So like I said, we got to get oh, you I one of those, it. we got to get you one of those nineties, uh, old school, uh, phones. I think it would add an, an, an element. I got a good story for you on that one. I filmed a music video in New York city with my friend, Chris Braun, uh, in 2017. And he had this vision that he wanted to use a pager in the video. And it was really hard to find a pager, especially a working pager. And through some way or other, he contacted some number that was connected to a pager company. And there are eight working pagers in New York City. That's kind of an amazing statistic. Like there's only eight. Who are these eight people with pagers connected, you know, who's still using a beeper in 2024 right now? Or that's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. really funny. Yeah, thing there. But yeah, dude, um, I also want to mention, I always say when I'm on like, I'm not opposed to being co-opted by corporate Delia. I think it's just like, dude, I, I participate in the modern world and economy, and I very much say my piece and speak freely with very yeah, few Yeah, pay filters. this dude off, dude. Pay him pay off. Pay me off, bro. <laughs> What's it going to take, man? I'm, I'm going to continue to eat these larger operations alive. Why not just bring me in under the umbrella? That's what I used to say when I was pain, when, we, when I was deep in the you know UFO community researching the documentary and just interacting with people kind of like what you do and uh i'm like dude if all these people are getting paid off to be quiet like dude pay me off i know yeah. you know i can see through tons of this bullshit i can tell you what the metaphysics and science is on a lot of this shit like this is not that well, you know like if you see me next year out rolling out the newest synthetic tryptamine that is coming out of johnson and johnson's lab do you it, won't bro. have to ask yeah. Yeah. absolutely <laughs> absolutely no hey like again Pay me off, bro. Pay me off. I, I'm I'm willing to live that life. No, I'm joking. I'm just like uh, like us both. Like nobody's paying us to do this. Well, actually, now people are. But like, uh, you you do this because you love it. Because it's a cool thing, and you get to meet lots of people, have lots of conversations, get to learn. That's a worthwhile. We just started pursuit. running ads this year, dude. I just started like really monetizing this year. And so a couple of people sent me like emails complaining. It's like you had five years of episodes where yeah. I didn't put one ad. On one thing, like we do a live stream podcast. I pay for services to like make this thing constantly look better. What's the newest thing? How can I integrate technology and make the camera and the lighting and the, you know, now I'm using chat GPT is basically my assistant now, um, you know, with the whole imaging stuff. Cause the images I used to make myself and it takes a while. And I mean, I'm decent with graphic art, but you know, it takes a while with chat GPT. It's like, I'll just dial it in, give it a few prompts and, make it revise a few things and here, you know, I sent oh, you the, the thumbnail. Like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, really well. you know, I, I think you just, like I said, you just gotta keep doing your thing. You're passionate about it. You'll be doing it, you know, as long as you want to do it, you know, like everybody's got a path. And for me, this is just something consistent. I'm kind of a homebody and, you know, I work from home too and do a lot of stuff from home. So it's like, it just makes sense for me to keep this, this train going here. And, and, um, yeah, I, I hope that you do too. And I really like what you're doing. And I've only listened to a handful of your podcasts. So, I mean, I've got a, a bunch of content to go through, which I appreciate too, because like I said, there's really not that many psychedelic podcasts that I listen to um, that have like quality guests that know what they're talking about. So. Thanks, man. Super appreciate it. And I super appreciate the invitation on here. And I've had a ton of fun, man. Like I haven't really, you know, been speaking from a script. I've just been kind of letting it rip. And just like you were saying, that's that's a fun way to do it. You know, uh, I try to be authentic and vulnerable and I very much present in my satire. That's more like scripted to a degree, although it is largely informed by improv. But I oftentimes will, you know, have sort of like a message I'm trying to get across. And uh, 
especially when I'm on other people's podcasts, like I just want to share my life experience and connect with you. And it's a networking racket. That's what I tell people, dude. Like I'm honestly so unconcerned with like number of downloads or like, you know, the, this and that and how well, like I'm not optimized. I was going to say that, dude, like I've had people come up to me, like serious investors, venture funds, people asking me about like probing about if there's a chance to work together. I'm like, Dude, I have no plan for the next year or two years. That's not how I see this, man. Like I'm going to, you know, maybe I'll get there and I'm getting to a point where like I have people who are helping me with stuff who are more driven and geared that way. But my whole point of what I want to do is just be really dialed into the craft, really enjoy it, appreciate it and grow it organically and with love and with a community and all that. And that's, that's happening. And I, I couldn't be, I couldn't be happier, dude. Like if somebody wants to write me a huge check, that'd be awesome. But I uh, also am extremely happy with what I'm doing right now. Oh, I've, I feel the vibes, dude. I've First of all, I was in sales most of my adult life until, you know, the pandemic hit, switched to, um, you know, IT tech stuff, that kind of stuff. But I will say this. I, I know when somebody is authentic and doing what you're saying, which is trying to like relate and vibe. And I felt that this whole conversation and you don't always feel that when you do podcasts with people for whatever reason, maybe they're nervous, you know, maybe there's a lot of different reasons why that could happen, but sometimes people just aren't authentic either. And you'll find that when people are trying to make money or they want something from you. And I feel like you are authentic and I have really, we just went two hours. It hasn't really felt like a two hour conversation, but we just went two hours and, um, yeah, man, I appreciate your time and what you're doing out there. And um, yeah, like everything you're saying is just resonating with me for sure. And, uh, you know, people do this thing too where they're kind of like, I call it podcast climbers, where you'll go on a bigger podcast, capture their audience, and then you just slowly keep climbing up the ladder until you've captured all these other people's audiences and you're a bigger podcast. And I've seen it happen like multiple times, by the way. And it's happened to me with other people using this platform too. So, um, you know, I don't feel that vibe from you. And I think that that's a good thing. And I just keep doing what you're doing and you're authentic and you're passionate and your, your content's great. Um, and, uh, yeah, man, keep, keep fighting the fight, keep grinding the grind, bro. Likewise. And I come out to Michigan a couple times a year. Chicago is where my in-laws live. My wife graduated from Hope College in Holland, oh, okay. Michigan. Yeah, so I love it up there. I've been to the Upper Peninsula a few yeah, times. We, so we I, just moved from like the northern suburbs of uh, Chicago back to the Detroit area. So cool. Well, I'm going to be out there in the fall, so I'll hit you up. We'll keep in touch with everything. And also to the seven people watching live right now, thanks for hanging out with us and listening to my wook ass go off on tangents and rants. And uh, and thank you for being an awesome host and for the intro and just the whole nine yards, dude. I feel super honored and blessed to have had this opportunity and invitation. So thanks again, Mike. And uh, yeah. Absolutely, man. You're welcome on anytime. We're always just having interesting conversations, chopping it up. And maybe next time we get a little weirder. You know, we're more comfortable yeah. with each other. You know, the the stories have been told. Let's let's get to the, you know, the weirdness of it. So I can't wait, man. I, <laughs> we just scratched the surface. So all right, um, bro. Well, thank but, you again. Yeah. Thank you so much. So if if anybody's interested, which you should be, please go check out all of Dennis's stuff. I have the link at the bottom next to the mushroom. Um, he's got a podcast, he's got content on X, he's on all the platforms. Go check it out. Uh the link tree's down there. Um, and again, I can't recommend it enough and, uh, yeah, follow them on, give them a nice review on the podcast. Give us a nice review on our podcast. If you're listening or watching, um, I'm gonna do that right now. Yeah. thanks bro. Um, and yeah, if you want to support mind escape, the best way to do is just click the link tree link down below. Uh, we do have a documentary that we created last year called as within, so without from UFOs to DMT. Um, kind of looking at those two phenomenons and then also like what's the crossover and the, you know, psychology and what's happening with the mind and philosophy and all that. So check that out. And that's it. I will. Uh, yeah, let's wrap it up here. I just want to say thank you again, Dennis. And we love everybody. Stay safe out there and uh, we'll catch you next time. Peace. Peace. See you all.